Welcome to the MuseCast, where we squeeze every last drop of inspiration out of Sunday's sermon. <laughs> this is this is like gonna be the permanent show opener now. <laughs> Me just cracking up laughing because you're all Whoa! Well, you know, I rearranged my little office area here, and so I have more coast space. Ooh. But yeah, except I don't like the new setup, so I'll probably shift it all back. But uh, okay. so I had this okay. one shining moment where I could really mm, pull that off. Do so. it. You could really the special effects. I'm gonna pop in a co- pop in a cough drop. Okay. Welcome to the music. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, it's Christmas week. So let's just say we're holly and jolly. How about That's that? That's right. That's right. That's why we're so goofy. Okay. Welcome to the Musecast. We are so glad that you're here. Happy Tuesday. Happy Christmas week. Happy all the things. Happy another blizzard coming into Minnesota tomorrow. Yeah. Dan, you and Barb got to get out of here. You got to get out of here while you can. Well, like, you know, seriously. it's it's uncanny. Like, we're going to be 20 degrees below average, like, these f- last couple days that we're here. And it, I, and this might be my paranoia, but I always feel like when we drive down, there's always something that tries to keep us here. And, uh, and, and two years ago, we drove down, and it's right away, right when we started driving, the blizzard hit. And it was a blizzard that went from the Twin Cities all the way down to the south side of Illinois. And it was just really, really treacherous. And um, and then on the way down, this is probably more than I need to share, but on the way down, coming on the other direction, there was a semi that was, um, it was like stalled on the side of the road, but it was on fire. And like all of these police cars and and uh, uh, fire trucks were around it, and and we were driving slow, and there was like police, you know, guiding us to exit off of the freeway and then re-enter just to get out of the way of this thing because the thing could explode, you know. And um, but it was wild because you looked at it and it just the, the semi, it was really weird. It looked like this flaming skull and it was just like these omens like don't go don't leave turn turn and go back and and uh, so I, I always feel that once you get past illinois then you know we're fine but i just feel like there are forces that are trying to keep us here and it's not it's not good minnesota loves you too much minnesota wants uh, to keep you in her borders <laughs> i was thinking more along the lines of satan that's what i was thinking so <laughs> I don't know about that. Sophie and Kat, you had a fun weekend. Yeah, yeah. What a what a hoot. So. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. All I yeah. can do is say I'm so sorry. And seriously, we haven't done this in a long time. We need a muse cast high five because. All right. Oh, buddy. hold on. Wait, wait. I gotta oh. I gotta go switch to the high, high five cam. high five cam. Okay. Now we're Ready? good. Yep. All right. <laughs> Why does Dan can't get a high five? Because literally <laughs> with no notice, he has to jump into the pulpit on Sunday. Some yay who just wasn't prepared and she didn't feel like she yeah. could go. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you sound you do sound better though. Thank you. Thank you. I am I'm feeling better. I'm uh we'll see. After this, I'll probably pass out, but yeah. I had to get on here and I had to say thank you. Well done, my friend, and and be with the newscast piece. My eyes are literally watering right now because of laughing so much. So <laughs> what was supposed to be <clears throat> I don't even, what was the title of my sermon? Oh, um, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is bad. I'm sorry. Open windows, full hearts. That's right. Became very, very well became the absurdity of loneliness. Yes. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So Dan stepped in to talk about loneliness and what it means uh, for Jesus coming to earth, the Christmas story, how that impacts and shapes this whole darkness that we face, loneliness. And Dan, again, kudos, way to go. Mm. Not only did you get to do a sermon last minute, but you get to do a sermon on a sermon that you did yeah. last minute. 
All right. You get to carry me today because I am worthless. So yeah, <laughs> take it away, well, friend. Yeah, thanks. You know, I I, I hope uh, I, it sounds like you're getting better. Hopefully, you will um, mm. continue down that path. Um, I, I will say that I, part of the reason why I was bummed uh, about preaching is because I felt like the sermon outline that you sent that you were going to do. That was really, really great, and I was really looking forward to hearing that. So I hope that you get a chance to share some of that stuff another time because uh, I thought it was great. It, it's <laughs> you can't do another person's sermon, so like I was looking at that, and I'm like, okay, I I can't go that way. And uh, I would love to hear what you were going to say on that, but I decided to go a different direction. And uh, really, what I was looking at is, um, you know, we're we're doing this Christmas series, so it's Christmas lights. So we're looking at these various darknesses in the world, and we're asking the question: How does the Christmas story shine a light against that darkness that we're we're experiencing right now? And we've looked at um, the chaos and instability of the world, and how the peace of God sort of uh, shines a light into that. We looked at um, the sense of meaninglessness and futility that people are experiencing, and how uh, the light of the Christmas story and kind of the the ultimate destination that God uh, offers us uh, and um, sort of the meaning that only God can offer us sort of uh, helps with that darkness. And then this week we were looking at loneliness because loneliness right now is just, it's becoming epidemic and, and people are, are feeling so lonely and isolated on top of that. Um, and so we were looking at what does, how does the Christmas story, how might that speak into that? And um and so what I did is I looked at, I just shared some loneliness statistics. Uh, and then um, I looked at this interesting question that Greg and I got on the mute on uh, the Musecast. We're the Musecast. Greg and I have a podcast called Apologies and Explanations. And somebody sent this question. They, they asked, why don't we have any writings from Jesus himself? Like all of the writings we have are from his disciples who recorded what Jesus said. And, uh, and we, there's a lot of debate because in some gospels, it says one thing. And then in another gospel, it says something else. And boy, it would just be really easy if we just had the writings of Jesus who could set all that stuff straight. And, and, you know, Luke says that, you know, if we were to write down, you know, everything that Jesus said, it would have filled, you know, more volumes than the world could hold. And it's, and it's like, boy, I wish Jesus just would have written some of that other stuff down. But what it does say is that, uh, at the very core of God's mission is community. Uh, even this most important thing that God is doing in the world where God, the creator of the universe, the ground of all being, the metaphysical source and sustainer of everything becomes a lowly person to bring about this, this agenda, this kingdom of God. And this is like the most important moment in the history of history. And even that uh, God does not do alone. He does through a community, through these kind of multiple perspectives. And it's just really uh it really says a lot about what's what God is doing, not just the ideas that God has, not just the uh, theology, but the actual uh, embodiment of of what Jesus came to teach. And and and, and in other words, what, what we see here is that God is profoundly prioritizing relationship over everything else. Relationship is the most important uh, part of this whole entire um, agenda, this whole entire mission. And what that looks like, uh, you know, the uh, angel told Joseph that, uh, you know, we're going to call this baby Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. And, uh, and they will call him Emmanuel. And um, Emmanuel means God with us. And so there, even in that name, Emmanuel, God with us, there is this um, sense of the prioritization of relationship. And what that looks like uh, is it, there's at least two parts of what that looks like. The first part that I looked at is that God in this relational prioritization uh, loves people as they are, just uh, fundamentally loves them inherently by default as they are. But part of that love also means calling people to be more than what they are, to be more uh, Christ-like. Uh, and, and I contrasted this with what we see in the world where 
the world <laughs> does not love us as we are unless we agree with their ideology and meet their expectations and and all and all these hoops that we have to jump to, through before we are loved uh but we're not inherently loved we have to sort of uh pass the test we have to earn it uh and and the world doesn't really want us inherently want us to grow or become better uh unless that means becoming more like them if, if that means like adopting their perspective and agreeing with their politics and and that's okay but anything else beyond that well you're either going to be now a threat to me a competition to me or you're going to be growing away from me and so growth is inherently sort of suspect in the world um but Jesus, you know, he calls us all brothers and sisters, and he even like with the 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 woman caught in adultery, he 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 says, "I don't condemn you." Uh, with it, that, in other words, I love you as you are. But now go and leave your life of sin. Now go and be better. And and uh, and I think that's kind of what that looks like. Um, and then I, I just kind of looked at, you know, what are the consequences of of living in this world that is not. That, that does not prioritize relationship, but prioritizes ideology and doctrine and stuff like that. And I just looked at like, you know, any of the hot button issues that we can look at right now, there is just this sense where you look at the sides of the debates, whether it's abortion or gun control or whatever, and both sides are just so convinced that they're right. And not only that, but that the other side is not only wrong, but there's something evil and there's something wicked and there's something flawed about them. And, and that, no matter what the debate is about, that mindset and that uh, kind of uh, perspective, uh, I argued, is really dangerous because what the world needs more than anything else is not political transformation, but personal and interpersonal transformation. What we need are things like uh, confession and repentance and mercy and forgiveness. But those things are incompatible with a person who already thinks that they're right and righteous and good. What If I'm already righteous and right, what do I need to confess? What do I need to repent of? Uh, and and why would I show mercy to somebody who is just evil? I don't want to reinforce the evil that they're doing. They need to change. And 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 so this uh, this kind of putting doctrine over relationship um, really sabotages the thing that we need more than anything else, and that's uh, forgiveness, mercy, and repentance and confession. Um. And then I just looked at some verses that uh, I thought did a good job of showing like these verses, these calls that like the Apostle Paul has, it doesn't really work in our world. And that's an indicator that there's something wrong with how we're working in the world. And so, for instance, uh, you know, Paul tells us to bear with one another. Well, we don't do that. I mean, we don't we bear with one another if they agree with us, but that's not really bearing with them because you don't really have to tolerate people that agree with you. You tolerate and you bear with people who disagree with you. And we tend to just um, uh, discard people who disagree with us. And um, and then uh, he says in First Thessalonians to build one another up. And we tend to not do that. We're, we tend to be masters at tearing one another down, humiliating people, showing the world how stupid the opponent is, stuff like that. That's what we've sort of mastered. And then the biggest call that I found, which is just very uh, motivating, <laughs> convicting, I guess you could say, is in Romans 12, uh, 10, where Paul uh, challenges us to outdo one another, make it a game, make it a contest to outdo one another in showing honor to each other. And we just do not play that game at all. And then finally, I just uh, I left it with a call to, um, you know, especially this holiday season, as people go back in, in there with their families and, and there's a lot of, usually there's a lot of uh, tension and and uh, latent sort of hostility and uh, and maybe a lot of dysfunction in, in the families that we go back to for Christmas. And I just challenge people to try uh, this Christmas and into 2023 to just serve as uh, a refuge where people can feel loved by you no matter what you believe. And, uh, and, and, and you can challenge them on this personal level to be better people uh, without, you know, challenging their doctrines and, and, and giving them hoops that they have to jump through in order to uh, win your affection and, and stuff like that. And I just think that 
it's not going to solve the world's problems, but boy, I think it's a good start. It's a good start to just think of yourself not as the bringer of doctrinal truth, but as the bringer of a refuge uh, for a world that is lonely and in need of deep connection. So that is my sermon. And um, uh, yeah, I, it was, I was really glad I was able to give it because um I feel like there's some important stuff there. Uh, but what did you think of it? Yeah. So it's so interesting the way it went down this past weekend, because like you said, I had something um, that I had was preparing and it's really, it's fun. Not that I, w not that I wish it came about the way that it did, but it's fun to hear someone else talk about your same topic and bring out different slivers of truth and, and highlight different things. That was really cool. I loved how you tied loneliness back to the creation story. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't, I, I wouldn't have gone there, you know? And yeah. I thought that was really cool. Like that was God's first, like, Ooh, problem we need to solve here. It's not good for man to be alone. <laughs> and yeah. So he created a partner and he created community for, for him and for us and how he's continually trying to combat that sense of loneliness and dread that people have um i love how you talked about relationship of course i love it i love, love it that's my jam relationship above all else relationship over law like that was a great example that you used with the woman um caught in adultery i guess <laughs> i guess she was doing that all by herself right because no one else was brought out to be stuck yeah isn't that funny <laughs> so i guess she, yeah. she wasn't doing that in community apparently because it was just right. her yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's another that's another topic. But you know that relationship over the law, relationship over doctrine, relationship over all else. I thought that was huge and really good. Um, I, I think my favorite thing is when you talked about what we need from each other. Is we we need to be people who repent, who show our vulnerabilities, and um, who are accepted. And that's what we need to offer others. We need to offer grace and mercy and forgiveness. Um, and be a safe place for people. Um, instead, you know, we're we're not that. We're like just so like toxic with one another. And you when you were talking about the vulnerability piece, and you said, you know, if if I'm vulnerable, and then I, and I need from you mercy and forgiveness and grace, but you like shame me and you use my vulnerabilities against me, then guess what? I'm not I'm not going to do that again. That's going to keep me from what I need. And so I thought that was a really really cool. Um, thing to highlight i really appreciated yeah. that so well, all that to say yeah, thumbs well, up thanks. sir go ahead yeah well thanks well you know it, it's interesting because there's there's something else i i wanted to say that i haven't thought it through articulately enough to say it i mean that's usually true with a lot of the stuff i say but you know <laughs> <laughs> this even to, by my standards didn't quite really cross it but there's just this idea that so many of our problems uh, have to be solved in relationship. They just, they do. And what happens is um, I think, and I can't, this is the part that I can't really prove or show, but it, it, it's sort of a suspicion at this point. We have, we have tried to solve our problems, not in relationship, but on a humanity wide level through these platforms where we project our arguments and our viewpoint and and we're looking for these these uh transcendent sort of truths that can that that we are the the megaphone for that will then now trickle down and solve all the world's problems but when you look at Jesus he does it the exact opposite he goes to the bottom and he enters into relationship with people and he solves problems uh in the context of each individual experiencing that problem and and i just feel like if we're not doing that my my concern is that we're actually somehow making the problem worse. Uh, yeah. I, we're 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 adding to the 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 toil, and and yeah. I haven't figured that out yet. But I just I just think it's suspicious that a God who prioritizes relationship over everything else 
we are debating our problems on platforms that are not relational at all. And, yeah. um, and I just think you take anything like you take, um, you know, uh, uh, abortion is a good example how you solve the abortion problem uh, on a national level it's just it looks different when you have a bunch of senators and congressmen arguing in a room versus when you have someone in your life who is pregnant because of some you know unwanted means it's, the the whole issue looks different if it's your daughter mm -hmm. or if it's your niece or something like that it mm -hmm. totally changes everything um yeah. and you know, maybe some people don't think that it does, but I, I, uh, I, I just, I, I think that it, I think it does. So I think it uh, does. I think proximity changes the game yeah, totally. Yeah. And by proximity, I mean like that face to face, that interaction, that like that real in relationship. I think a lot of things that we would spew on our keyboards, you know, on our yeah. socials, I think it changes when we're like right here. Um, and it's like, it's real to us um yeah. and the proximity of the relationship that we have with the person going through it i think changes yeah. the game for sure so i like that thought that you're developing it's more fleshed out than you think and i um i think you'll be able to use it somewhere sometime yeah soon sometime <laughs> maybe on a muse well, cast episode I'll may maybe maybe <laughs> who knows well it just made me think of there there's this um uh there's this trend that had been going around on TikTok just talking about you know it poking fun you know um in jest at meeting new people now versus back in the back in the day which even a few years ago it's so different but it's like where were you on January 6th where's your stance on this where it's just like, yeah it's all to be like hot topic like you just boom get those out of the way quick Okay, do we line up on that? Okay, then we can pursue friendship, dating, or whatever type of relationship. <laughs> it's it's kind, yeah. of, kind of comical. Um, I do, I love when you talked about how the world is, is always trying to change us, but with God, we are accepted and we have belonging. Just, just, where, just where we are. He meets yeah. us where we're at, and he loves us where we're at. And if we never changed, he would still love us, but he loves us. And because of that love, he does want us to be better. We want to be better. The yeah, world is always trying to change us first and then say, now, now yeah, right. you're acceptable. Now right. we can be friends. <clears throat> Not that way with Jesus. And I love that. I'm trying to think if I had any, I'm sure I had many thoughts. Some were medically induced because of medicine. <laughs> Some were... <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just leave it there for now yeah. but that's a great podcast question that you and greg got in yeah um i had yeah that's a great question you have to bring some more of those maybe sometimes to the newscast we did have a question about your sermon do you want to answer okay. it let's do it you ready <clears throat> yes can you hear me <clears throat> yes okay good um <laughs> i'm thinking of the question oh yes uh the angel said to, you should call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yep. And then that's pretty much it, right? Like <laughs> no one is he ever called Emmanuel for the rest of the story or for the rest yeah. of time. Who knows? I mean, I know like today we talk about the different names of Jesus, but um, well, so what happened with that? What's up with that? And I probably butchered the question, Dan. Um, yeah, that's so all right. The need to re yeah. So, yeah. but do you get the gist of it? Like, yes, I do get the the gist okay. of it. So, uh, let's see. Da -da -da -da. Um, all right. So, first of all, uh, Mary is told that they're going to name uh, the child Jesus because he's going to save the people from uh, their sins. But then the angel uh, tells. Um, uh, Joseph, he says, Joseph. the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him and they will call him Emmanuel, uh, which means God with us. And so how I because like what happened with that? What, how come nobody calls him Emmanuel? We all call, you know, what would Jesus do? Not what what would Emmanuel do? We just Emmanuel. we always refer back to Jesus. And so how I make sense of this is that um, it's kind of like, you know, Michael Jordan is the goat. We say that, you know, he is the goat, the greatest of all time. We that's a that's something that the kids say on TikTok and Twitter and on IHOP and all of that. Uh or LeBron so, James. Or, or LeBron James. I'm just <laughs> I don't think anybody in their right mind says that, but I'm sure there's some there's some crazy people who say who say that. <laughs> all okay, right. Okay, fine. Okay, basketball aside. 
so that's kind of like a, a, a title, like a um, an honoring sort of title. And I think that is what's happening here. His name is Jesus, and that's that's uh, what they were supposed to name him. But they will call him Emmanuel. And I haven't looked at the Greek on this, and so uh, mostly because I really like the answer, and I don't want the Greek to prove me wrong. So uh, I'm I, I that's what I'm going with. I'm going with uh, this that it's it's more of an honorary title that people will will use as they think of Jesus. Uh, he he is God with us. So what do you think of that? Uh, I'm going to go with you. I too will not dig into the Greek. Let's just leave it. (laughs) One thing, and I think you're uniquely qualified to answer this because of uh, one of your 2087 different jobs that you've held um, as a counselor slash therapist. Um, I'm wondering if, and you're talking about relationship above all else, above, you know, and and I agree above law, above doctrine, and and in your challenge to be that safe haven, be that refuge for folks, because especially this time of year when we're entering into context with families that may you know maybe have some dysfunction or or relationships that are less than ideal, um, like can we be that refuge? Can we be that place where people are accepted as they are, and we just kind of put aside the things that we differ over. Do you think that's something that's true, like across the board, 100% of the time, or are there times when people, when the relationship does need to maybe not take the priority? Yeah. Well, I, I do think there are probably a lot of times when, because I really, I think that, um, you know, you, I think that I, there's, well, there's a lot of things to say there. I guess what I would say is that, first of all, you need to be safe. You need to protect yourself. And, and uh, I don't think Jesus is calling us um, to put ourselves in harm's way. In fact, you see Jesus multiple times fleeing from danger. And uh, he, there's nothing glorious about being hurt or being, uh, you know, you shouldn't seek out martyrdom. And when you look at the martyrs of the first, second, and even third century, they weren't seeking out martyrdom. They, they, they were trying to stay safe, but they were still loving. And, and I think that that should be the way it is too. So if you're in a family situation where you don't feel safe, uh, or if you feel traumatized by a family member or something like that, then absolutely there's, 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 uh, there's, it's almost you could almost say it's better for the relationship if you stay away from that until you are safe around that person, until that person is safe, until um um and, you know enough until there's been healing or something like that. Sometimes you have to do that. I just think that we have swung way in the other direction where um we we get we sabotage, we throw our hands up, we discard a relationship for really minor, silly things. And we use that as a way to control relationships. If, you know, oh yeah, well, I'm done with this family and then you leave and and you use that as a way of of kind of teaching them a lesson. And and that's the kind of stuff that, that that's not good. And, um, and that ends up, I think, sabotaging the work that God wants to do in your families and in your relationships. And so, so yes, definitely be safe. And, and, you know, unfortunately there are really families that are very dysfunctional and people hurt one another and, and people have been traumatized in families and, and in relationships. And, and that means that, you know, you don't do anybody any good if you're traumatized and if you are in a state like that. And so, um, uh, you know, I think it's ultimately better for relationships in those situations to keep yourself distant and safe until you are more secure and healed and and so forth. That's probably a redundant roundabout answer, but that's what I think of that. No, I think that's great. And I think that's an important distinction to make. And I'm glad that you did. Um, and I agree. I think the pendulum has swung too far the other side. We're just like, you wore blue. It was supposed to be a day where we all wear brown. Hey, right. <laughs> I'm done with huh. you. <laughs> you know? It's just like, oh my gosh. So this leads me to my final question for you today, Dan. <clears throat> How can we like find our way out? Because from since the dawn of time, since the birth of humanity, there have been differences. There's been there have been things that we don't agree on. We know that. There's been loneliness. You've talked about that. But it feels like 
the trench is getting wider and wider and it's getting easier and easier to just isolate and pull away and just surround ourselves with like minds and like voices. How can we break out of this, this polarity, these tensions, this toxicity? Like it seems really, really bad. And I'm sure there are people in previous generations that have said it seems really, really bad, but yeah. honestly, right now it seems really, really bad. And so what are some starting points? And I know we can't change a global issue, but what can we do as individual kingdom people to begin to bridge that divide? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, the first thing is stop. I think, I feel like we're all being groomed right now to be little social engineers where we, we lobby and we say things and we post things and we do things for, um, because we want people to see our side and we want people to see the horrors of society as we see them. And, and so we, we, everything we do is kind of tactical. And, and so the first thing I'd say, is stop all of that, just be a person, you know, just be a person and uh, you know, Tell us about your humanity, not about your ideology. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, we have a tendency to uh, always try to invest in relationships that will benefit us. And so we're always looking for people who are, you know, where we want to be. And so we want to be close to them and we want, you know, and, and so we're always looking for upwardly mobile people and, um and I think that in order for us to solve the loneliness crisis, we need to be able to um, look at how can we help people who are not doing very well uh, in this arena? How can we um, stoop down? How can we look at the bottom and work from the bottom up uh, and and love from the bottom up, not just for their sake, not for my own sake, and to invest my social capital and my social energy into people that I don't get a reward for or or any type of return on my investment, just for their sake alone. And I think really this just comes back to what the Apostle Paul said is to, uh, you know, bear with one another. That is, be in relationship with people that are hard <laughs> to be in relationship with. That's, where, that's who you have to bear with. And to uh, try to honor one another instead of uh, you know, only honoring people who are like you and who agree with you, honoring people as they are. Uh, and to build one another up instead of always trying to find the people that you need to tear down. Look, for, there's a lot of people in this world who need to be built up. And there's a lot of hurting. There's a lot of uh, lonely people that need building up. Uh, there's more people that need building up than that need tearing down. And there's plenty of people in the teardown business. There's not a lot of people in the build up business and, and we need more yeah. of that. So those are probably the things just off the top of my head that I would say, it's a really good question. How about you? Is there anything that I missed? No, I no, I think that's so good. And um, you know, when you were talking that final point, do you remember or have you ever heard this phrase like that person needs to be knocked down a peg or two? <laughs> yeah. Like have you ever heard Yeah, that? totally. Yeah. We have a lot of people who feel like they're the ones to do it, right? I'll be <laughs> right. the ones to right. how about how about that person needs to be built up a little bit, needs right. to be encouraged a little bit. Yeah. Let's get out of the knocking down business. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have your beliefs or the things that you um stand for but let's get down let, let, let's quit dehumanizing people and let's just get back to the business of encountering one another and seeing what might we learn from one another and if we don't agree that's okay there's still humanity in you that god loves and humanity in me that god loves and so that's something we have in common so yeah, yeah. um that's but yeah i liked your <laughs> i liked your answer thank you Good. for uh, going where you went with that. Um, I do believe, Dan, unless you have something else, I do believe we've reached nugget time. All right. And these will be our final nuggets before Christmas. Yes. <laughs> because Christmas is this weekend. So um, they don't need to be Christmas themed at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying final nuggets before Christmas. So mm. for those of you who have been writing down all the nuggets and are going to box them up in a really pretty <laughs> um thing and give it to someone as a gift these are the final ones before christmas so. <laughs> that's funny um <laughs> am i going am i going first yeah okay uh yeah. yeah i think i think what i would say is uh and i might have shared this nugget for other topics because it is one of my favorite 
kind of insights. And and that is simply this. And this is, you know, specifically because there's different people on this loneliness kind of crisis. There's people who are um, uh, socially, they're wealthy socially. They're not lonely. Their hearts are full. And, um, and they, I think, have a different call than people who are lonely. And in the same way that if there's an economic crisis, people who are poor are in a different situation than people who are rich in an economic crisis. And and God, I think, expects different things from them. And so for people who are socially rich during this loneliness crisis, I think, I think what God is calling us to is to uh, start connecting and sharing your social capital and your social charisma and all of that and toward people that you don't get a return from, toward people that that you can just love and and connect with just for their sake just for the sake of of building them up um and so that's what i would say uh for for those people for people on the other end people who are lonely and and who are really feeling the weight of this loneliness crisis this is what i've come back to time and time again and it's been really helpful for me personally as well in my life and that is simply this if we are built to have agape love relationships that means that of course we are fulfilled and we are nourished when people love us with agape love. But since we're made for this, I really believe that we are also nourished, even if we don't get that agape love, but if we give agape love to others. Uh, I think that we can get nourishment, spiritual nourishment from that outgoing love. And so, uh, you know, and, and I shared the example uh, on Sunday of uh, Barbara, who, you know, I just see her, just, she loves these animals just for the sake of the animal. And she loves loving them. And, and she gets nourished just by the presence of these animals, even though the animals can't really give her anything back. Back. If anything, they're sort of a hassle and they, they get into our bird seed and they, you know, knock down our, our, our pots and, and, but she just loves them just for their sake. And she gets nourished by that. I think we can do that with people too. And, and I think that this can be very revolutionary, especially if you're feeling loneliness, because I really believe that getting good at loving others and, and tapping into the nourishment of loving others really goes a long way to filling that emptiness in our heart. It doesn't fill it all the way, but it helps a, a, a lot. And so that that's my, my nugget is if you are feeling lonely, instead of instead of just waiting for the that loneliness to be filled by others go out and try to fill somebody else's loneliness with your presence and and i think that you know that will uh if anything it'll nourish you from your outgoing love but it might also be reciprocated you, you never know but uh but even if it's not it's still good and that is my final pre christmas nugget very good, Dan Ken. <laughs> I have two. So two double banger. Oh, this is a special double Christmas. Banger. Yes. <laughs> um, my first one is like seriously allow God um to meet you in your loneliness if you are experiencing loneliness. Um, loneliness is an equal opportunity sickness. It doesn't matter your age, your gender, your economic status. Like there are young people who are literally dying from immense loneliness. And there are older folk, old people that are literally dying from immense loneliness. And in that loneliness, we truly are not alone. The whole thing about Emmanuel is that it's God with us. Mm. So allow God to meet you in your loneliness. Allow him to heal whatever it is that needs to be healed. Or allow him to reveal whatever it is needs to be revealed. Allow him to give you the wherewithal to reach out to someone and say, Hey, I need, I need some connection. Cause, cause sometimes people are just so busy. They're not gonna, they're not gonna notice. And so it's going to take us being vulnerable and saying, Hey, I have a need here. But also like Dan said, maybe you're in a place where you're feeling fulfilled and you're feeling relationally rich. And if that's the case, then might God use you to meet the needs of someone else who is in a season or a space of loneliness. And so mm. let's live that out. God with us um, in our loneliness, whether it's our own or the loneliness of someone else's. I think that's really important. 
My second nugget is you guys need to get you a Dan Kent in your life. You need a <laughs> friend by the name of Dan Kent who can step in. <laughs> if you've got a project that you can't make it to, if you've got a sermon you're supposed to preach, but she gets sick, um, you know, if there's a task or something you need. So that's that's an assignment. Uh, get you a Dan Kent. <laughs> supplies, <laughs> supplies are limited. Supplies are limited. Supplies are limited. So <laughs> get them while you can. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I'm serious, man. Thank you so, yeah, so much. Well, yeah. I, I was glad I was able to do that, and and yeah. I, I do. It's really weird. Like, all right, for, I'll just I'll confess this too. All right, mm -hmm. I, there's something kind of exhilarating about you have 20, 24 hours to put together a sermon, less than twenty four hours plus sleep, you know. And there's something exhilarating about like trying to do that and get that done. And mm -hmm. it was it was fun. And and I, I really feel like. Um, after I put it together, I did feel like I'm really glad I was had that opportunity to to share that yeah. before Christmas. And so, and I'm absolutely. glad you're feeling better too, of course. So yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe I'll give, I'll give my sermon, like, I don't know, in the, in a different time of year. And, and so if you hear something that relates to marriage, so just, <laughs> right. it's fine. It's fine. Just roll with <laughs> don't it. You, don't you worry about yeah. it. <laughs> Every day is Christmas. That's, That's right. That's right. That's right. Jesus is the reason for the season. That's right. Oh, you guys, we are so thankful for you. Thank you for tuning in today, for sticking with us. We were Holly, we were jolly, we were goofy, but that's that's what we do. Looking forward to chatting with you all when the show airs on YouTube at 4 p.m. Don't forget, tune into our Christmas service if you're live streaming. That'll be at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Nothing Saturday. on Sunday. Be with your people. Saturday is the day that you want to tune in for that live stream. Have a Merry Christmas, you guys. We're thankful for you. We'll see you next week after Christmas. <laughs> Bye.